All right. Are there any questions? Wendy. I wanted to ask about the state of the union last night. And okay. Okay, uh, an interesting, good question. Um, let me make one overview of the State of the Union address. The pitiful amount of attention he gave to foreign policy. I mean, it just didn't register at all. You know, and in some respects, that's a reflection of Obama's decision that the United States is gonna pull back. Um, you know, we, can, we will have debates at the, toward the end of the class about American decline. Okay, whether or not American power is decreasing in the world. And that's a healthy, intelligent debate, but Obama's already made the decision that the U.S. is gonna pull back the number of commitments it's made. And, you know, just... I think that the question is, is that decline or maturity? Maturity? Well, Obama would argue that it's maturity. Yeah. Yeah, and he's not doing it out of position of weakness. And if you think about it, given the dysfunction in the Congress and the blockage A nonpartisan comment. A smart president would say, let's focus on foreign policy for the remainder of my term, because then I can get things done without having to go through Congress. Um, I think that there will be a move by conservatives in the House and the Senate to put legislation forward to increase restrictions on Iran. I probably won't pass. If it does pass, they'll veto it. Will they override They will no, not override they, they won't have the votes to override, no. It takes 67 to override a veto. The bill itself will do harm, and it will be a test of Rouhani, President Rouhani's commitment, Rouhani is the president of Iran, uh, to keep going on the same path. And he's got obstacles, just like Obama's got obstacles. Um, yeah, there's a conservative group in, in Iran that's equivalent to the conservatives in the House and Senate. Um, I think that, um, I think Obama made a very credible and persuasive case last night on the Iran. Look, let's give diplomacy a chance. If it doesn't work, we'll know about it very quickly. And as soon as we know about it, I'll be coming to you for more aggressive, uh, aggressive policy actions. I mean, it puts the people who want to put, who want to increase restrictions in a difficult position, it seems to me, politically and ideologically. Okay. Uh, there's no doubt that there are a lot of people that want to scuttle these peace negotiations. No question about it. But Obama and Rouhani are well aware of the obstacles. They're not naive. And you know they've calculated how much grief they can take. Uh, and in the, if, you, if you read the agreement that was done uh, with Iran, it's very clear there's a clause in that agreement that no new sanctions would be imposed on Iran for the six month period of the uh, agreement. And then Obama insisted upon inserting a clause that said, in so far as national legislation allows. Okay, so Obama was sort of signaling to Rouhani that I've got to worry about my Congress. And Rouhani still signed it. So Rouhani knows these people aren't fools. 
And so it's really a question of how they navigate the storm and drong of the opposition. You know, here we have the classic dilemma of all foreign policy, which is measuring intentions versus capabilities. You know, when you're in diplomacy, you're thinking about intentions all the time. Israel and the supporters of Israel in the Congress, and it's a nonpartisan issue because the Democrats are the ones I worry about more than Republicans, um, are worried about capabilities. They get money from the Israel, from the Jewish lobby than the Republicans. Well, the Israel lobby, not the Jewish lobby. Let me, let me ask you this question with regard to the Israeli position, Netanyahu's position, because they obviously oppose these talks. Here's what I think Netanyahu thinks, and tell me whether this is sensible or silly. Netanyahu thinks that the Iranians are willing to negotiate to the enrichment of uranium, but at a level that will allow them, after the negotiations are finished, if some crisis develops, to quickly produce a nuclear weapon, even though they're below the level now that we decide is acceptable. In other words, it's a question of enrichment. It's, you know, I don't know what, what the number is. You probably do. To, to produce a nuclear weapon. Ninety-five percent enrichment for a bomb. How much? Ninety-five percent. Well, see, they're at twenty percent. They're at twenty percent right and, now. Um, and I think that Netanyahu feels that they're going to be the West is going to be duped into a treaty that allows Iran to have the restrictions moved, removed, but that they still remain a, retain a sufficient nuclear capability to, in any crisis, within a matter of months, produce a nuclear weapon. And Netanyahu is exactly right. Iran now has that capability. They have the centrifuges in place where they can produce a nuclear bomb. So the question is, do we believe that it's feasible for Iran to give up that capability? Or do we negotiate a cessation of their activities indefinitely? Say that again. Do we want Iran to give up its capabilities, which means physically destroying the centrifuges they've already built? Would that, would that satisfy Netanyahu? That would satisfy Netanyahu, but it would be an unprecedented step. Uh, because don't forget, Iran is bound by the Non-Proliferation Treaty. The Non-Proliferation Treaty allows enrichment up to 20%. Hey, listen, if I was in Iran and I was making these decisions, I'd say, look, I got Israel with a nuclear weapon, I got India with a nuclear weapon, I got the Soviet Union with a nuclear weapon, I got to get a nuclear weapon. I don't blame them for trying. Iran's in a bad neighborhood. I think it's important to note, too, that this is not to group all of Israeli politics into one category, because there's the, there's the Kadima party in Israel that's very liberal, there's Labor that's very liberal, there's a huge youth movement in Israel right now about denuclearization, about Palestinian solidarity, about Iran. Um, but if you look at the kind of the hawkish heads of Likud, especially somebody like Ehud Barak, who recently, I mean, a year ago, in the past six months, I mean, the, the kind of language I've read him, you know, espouse about Iran has been especially hawkish. It hasn't been necessarily about Israeli defense, but more about Israeli aggression and more about, you know, planning certain airstrikes into Iran and that kind of thing. And I think when a country like Israel that's already vulnerable goes into attack mode, I don't think that's diplomatically feasible, but it's also, I think, kind of dangerous and ignorant for him to be doing that. I mean, it's something to, to recognize that, like you mentioned before, I mean, in, from the Iranian point of view, the United States has nukes, India has nukes, Israel has the capability to, you know, send nuclear weapons out. If we're talking about the like, geopolitical fairness, how, from, from I guess an objective point of view, the Iranians are just doing what they can from their perspective to preserve themselves. Um, and I, I, think, I think the danger in foreign policy is to have hawkish people on either side. Ahmadinejad and Netanyahu, in my opinion, are in the same camp. I don't, I don't think they're helping their people at all in, in furthering their own ends. Well, there are crazy people every place, okay? Uh, the job of diplomacy is to try to keep them out of the kitchen. Um, and let's hope that diplomacy works. 
I also don't really understand how vulnerable Israel is. I think the vulnerability of Israel is on the, the recent negotiations with the United States. Um, and the United States approaching Iran on negotiation and it's sort of, I think Israel really fears that kind of um, negotiation and diplomacy between the United States and Iran because as long as Iran is viewed by the United States as enemy number one in the Middle East, that gave Israel some sort of superiority because they're really competing for who's going to be the most powerful in that region. And I think Iran, with this recent negotiation, is kind of coming up. And Israel is not very liked in the Middle East right now. Um, I think regardless of what internal politics happen, you know, who's, I guess, um, conservative and who isn't, I think the ultimate bottom line is that there is more attention paid to Iran right now than there is to Israel. Yeah, well, um, I, I don't know how long I'm, we should prolong this discussion because we're going to be getting to the issue of Israel and Iran later on in the course. Let me say this, just to, to give you a, a framework to think about things. There are two threats that Israel is worried about. One is the rise in power of Iran in the Middle East. Now, the reason why the Israelis are worried about that is because after the U.S. invasion of, of Iraq in 2003, and the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, the US tipped the balance of power in the Middle East. Iraq was a strong supporter of the Sunni position under Hussein. Under Maliki, it's a strong supporter of the Shi Shia position. How ironic. Pardon me? I mean, it's unbelievably ironic. Yeah. And so the Israelis are worried about the balance of power threat of Iraq. But there's also a secondary not a secondary, th a second threat. And that's the existential threat. Because the Israelis know that one nuke dropped on Israel ends Israel, okay? So as far as the Israelis are concerned, it's a one-shot deal. Don't I, conflate I mean, I, those two. I, I hear what you're saying. The United States' official position is that any nuclear attack on Israel will be perceived as an attack on the United States and will be responded to accordingly meaning that if Iran were to launch a missile at Israel and kill 100,000 people, we would completely annihilate Iran. But that's not the way it's going to play out. It's going to play out in a more covert fashion. If Iran gets a nuclear weapon and leaks it to Hezbollah, and Hezbollah just plants a suitcase somewhere in the middle of Tel Aviv that kills 100,000 people, how do you know how to respond? Um, in other words, it's not a direct attack by Iran. It's one of their one of their allies. Yeah, but but um, look, I, mean, I think Israel is more concerned about the terrorist implications of nuclear weapons, um, especially under the control of Hezbollah, who is sponsored by Iran. And I think that's just uh, Looney Tunes. Really? Yeah. The idea that any state would give a non-state actor a nuclear weapon is just bonkers. No state in its right mind would want to see nuclear weapons floating around in the world in hands that can't be controlled. I think North Korea would. I, what's the evidence for that? Pakistan. Well, we had A.Q. Khan who gave out plans. There's yeah. no question about that. But, you know, I mean, that's different from physically giving someone a nuke. You can give the plans to Hezbollah. Hezbollah's already got plans to build a nuke. You know, you can get that out of the Encyclopedia Britannica if you want. Um, you know, I mean, so let's let's keep this all in the realm of possibility. And, and we've got two hands, and then we're going to stop. Okay, in the back.
And why would a state give another entity a nuclear weapon that could blackmail the, the original state? I feel like I hear this thing from like That's just, the American public all the time. Like, people are worried, like, well, if certain countries want nuclear, they will give this to this group. It's like, where is this country coming from? Yeah. Where is this country coming from? It's just. If I may say, we'll talk about this later, but there's a Kantian set of assumptions to your re most recent statement, namely the assumption that most human beings are rational. Yes. And I don't think the 20th century tends to support that belief. Well, I mean, yes, I see what you're saying, but I mean, we're not talking about just logic and rationality here. If a government leaks a nuclear weapon to a terrorist, or a terrorist organization, which then attacks Israel, which then brings an attack out on them, that's just like basic like, survival. If you don't do that, you don't want to be annihilated. I mean, we're talking about like basic like, Cold War dynamics here. No one would in, like willingly incite a nuclear war on I agree wholeheartedly. Last comment. Yeah, Sorry, to go. Tammy. Go. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Make your comment. It's illogical, but I think it can happen. That you could go now. Would it's illogical, but you yeah. think it could happen. Okay. I, I mean, in terms of to, to the gentleman on, on the right side of the room, I agree with you in the sense that. On your on, right side of the room. Uh, yeah, on, <laughs> on my right side of the room. I'm usually on the left side of the room. <laughs> In terms of Hezbollah, Hezbollah, in, if you look at the 2006 you know, conflict, 2008 conflict between Israel and Lebanon, Hezbollah was a stronger military presence than the Lebanese army. I mean, they have a lot of parliamentary representation. Hassan Nasrallah is a very polarizing figure. I mean, Hezbollah is, more, is closer to a state entity than I would say that this kind of is a loosely configured terrorist group, which they are. Um, so, I mean, I, I think I see some validity in that. And Hezbollah isn't just any, you know, it's not, say, al-Shabaab in Somalia. It's, it's a little more cohesive than that. Um, would, a sta would, would Iran necessarily give nukes to, to Lebanon? No. I mean, there's, there's too much religious pluralism there. Um, but I don't think that it's completely far-fetched to believe that Hezbollah could get their hands on, on something like that. All right. I agree. Done. We gotta go. Oh yeah, we gotta go. We look. We have two things that we have to pick up from last time that we didn't finish off, and we better do that. And then we want to talk about the first foreign policy of the United States, which is its foreign policy toward the Native American nations of North America. <laughs> two points. When we were, we didn't really discuss the Melian Dialogue, uh, but there's one consequence of the Melian Dialogue which is pertinent to our discussion about the way uh, the United States interprets its position vis-a-vis -vis the Native American nations. Uh, and as the background to this is, is the discussion between the Athenians and the Melians about what an empire is. And if you remember correctly, those of you who read the uh, dialogue, the, when the Athenians come to Melos, you know, basically they say, you've got to submit to us because we believe that you're allied with uh, Sparta. And the Melians say, no, no, we don't have anything to do with Sparta. Just leave us alone. And then the Athenians say, but that's not the way empire works. Empire demands your submission. And the Melians then say, no, 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 no. What if we do this? What if we declare our neutrality to all of Greece and you know, just say, we're not going to take sides in the war between Athens and Sparta. And the Athenians come back and say, no, you still don't understand empire. Because if we let you declare your neutrality, everyone else will want to declare your neutrality. Empire demands submission. And finally, the Melians don't try to re re reason with the Athenians. They basically say, look, don't take us over because it's wrong. I mean, they, they bring in the moral argument. You know, the idea of subjugation is just wrong. And this is where the Athenians say, don't use words like right or wrong to us. For you know as well as we that in the affairs of men, the strong do as they will, and the weak suffer what they must. Now, implicit in that proposition is the right of conquest. The right of conquest is a long-standing principle in world politics. 
I mean, you can go back as far as you want to go. You can go back to the Battle of Megiddo, the first recorded uh, military battle in human history. And the right of conquest is always regarded as a privilege that is due to the winner of a conflict. You win the battle, you earn the submission of the people you have just defeated. Now, this is a proposition that in the 20th century has slowly but surely been unraveled. And the signing of the UN Charter is the first time that the world basically says the right of conquest does not exist. Because don't forget, the UN Charter forbids the first use of aggression. The only time states are entitled to use violence is in response to a direct attack on them. If there is an issue be to be decided among nations, according to the UN Charter, it must first be referred to the United Nations Security Council. So the UN Charter gets rid of the right of conquest. And this is one of the interesting things that comes out of the Arab-Israeli dispute, because in 1967, and Israel is a signatory to the UN Charter, when Israel takes over the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and the Golan Heights, the first response of the UN Security Council is to pass Resolution 232, which says these territories must be returned. They have yet to be returned, because in, for some members of the Israeli society, the right of conquest still exists, that that territory is now Israeli territory. Now, the reason why this is pertinent to the discussion about North American nations, and we'll get to this after we talk about Kant, is that the Americans did not colonize North America. The British did. The French did. The Dutch did. The Spanish did. The Russians did. Americans didn't even exist at the time the Europeans divided up the North American continent. And therefore, when the United States appears in 1789, it is the case that the United States is already dealing with a conquered peoples. Most of the Native Americans sided with the British in the revolution. Yeah, in point of fact, I mean, they're, I mean the, the United States is dealing with the allies of their adversary. You know, it's to put it in a balance of power context. So it's a weird situation. Keep that in mind when we get to the treatment of the North American nations, let okay? Me, let me do something here. I know we're not gonna talk about this at length now. This is the United States, and this is the Mississippi, okay? You draw as well as I do. Yeah, this is maybe, maybe a little worse. And um, by the Treaty of Paris ending the revolution, the United States acquired from Great Britain this. Everything east of the Mississippi, actually they don't get Florida, that's still, that's still Spain. There are approximately 100,000 Native Americans living in this space. And the question, even before 1789, after the revolution, is what do we do about that? Eventually, the answer is going to be Indian removal. Right. West. Get rid of them. Based on a conquest theory. And some of the treaties signed with the Native Americans, they had signed like 20 treaties, are based on the conquest theory. You lost, you have no say in this matter. If you think about it, the Treaty of Paris, signed over here in Paris, essentially decides the fate of this territory without any involvement of the Native Americans at all. They've been living here for like 2,000 years. But they have no say in it. Anyway, the point that we'll talk about later and I just want to introduce now is there are a lot of people, including George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, who believe that 
the very values on which the American Revolution were based were inherently anti-imperialistic. Right. In other words, what we're calling the conquest theory cannot be a doctrine that the United States morally and ideologically endorses. They have to find some way to satisfy this Native American problem without being engaged in the kind of coercive behavior that they had accused Great Britain of. Okay? They, Washington comes up with this idea when he's president. We're going to set up enclaves, about four or five of them, in which we allow Native Americans to live in peace and over time, like a century, assimilate. By the way, they think Native Americans can be assimilated. They don't think African Americans can be assimilated. This is the theory. It's unimplementable. Henry Knox, the Secretary of War, says, in order to implement this strategy, we need about 100,000 troops. Why? The numbers. In 1776, the number of Native Americans in this region is 100,000. The number of Europeans or European origin people is 2,000. In 1780, the number of Native Americans is 80,000. The number of whites is 10,000. In 1790, the number of Native Americans is 70,000. The number of whites is 50,000. In 1800, the number of Native Americans is 60,000. Now get this, the number of whites is 500,000. There is a population explosion in this region based on migration across the Alleghenies. In the end, they don't have to do anything at an overt political level and decide that they're going to endorse Indian removal in the conquest theory. They let demography do the work. They're just, and disease, you know, they're passing on diseases to the Native Americans so that it's a kind of genocide in slow motion done without any official commitment to a policy of Indian removal. And it's based on the fact that everybody who wants land is going across the Alleghenies into this region. Um, we'll talk more about it later. Yeah, I mean, the only point I wanted to introduce was the right of conquest. But okay. it's what I'm saying is we are uncomfortable with it is the a contest imperialistic position. It's a contested proposition among the founding fathers. We, and here, I would even go further and say one of the reasons we don't do it very well with this Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan, because we don't really believe it. We really, this is at odds with fundamental values at central to the founding of the United States. We cannot be an imperial power. It is at odds with our core identity. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty far, I know. Yeah, really. I mean, you, well, but that's, I mean, that's hard to... Happen. That's hard to entertain given the treatment of Africans. I mean, the, the American was very the Americans were very comfortable subjugating a whole group of people. Slavery is an exception to everything. Uh, well, no, I don't think so. Slavery is integrated warp and woof into the American character, and it was from the very beginning. But they all, I mean, every man, every prominent founder, Washington, Hamilton, Jefferson, Adams, Madison, all agree that slavery is fundamentally incompatible with the values on which the American Revolution is. Well, they may have agreed, the but is, they how do you end it without destroying the nation? Well, no, they could have ended it by giving up their own slaves, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 Pr pretty simple, pretty straightforward. You know, I mean, it's no. It's not that simple. The entire, if it came up three times, Vinny, 1776, 1789, 1791, and every time when it came up, South Carolina, Georgia, and Virginia said, if you talk about this and attempt to enforce it, we secede. And you're absolutely right. There are a whole bunch of considerations that the United States had to consider. I mean, things that had to be factored in. Okay, but 
I mean, what I'm contesting is the proposition that the anti-imperial mentality that you described was as pervasive as you described. Because there it's is only for whites. there is an exception carved out. Well, it's for whites and Indians. But they make an exception to blacks because Jefferson believes that blacks are inherently inferior. Well, they, they, no, they make exceptions for Asians in the, uh, in the 1800s in, in California. We, I mean, we had coolies. I mean, we make exceptions all the time for people that we want to use as slaves. Yeah, that would suggest that they're not exceptions. Pardon me? That would that they're not exceptions. That's really interesting. Well, um, except for the proposition that Joe is developing is that there are certain categories that we would not think about making people slaves. Yeah, they don't want to enslave even Native Americans. They would not enslave Asians. They just make them work on the railroad forever. Um, yeah, well. I mean, look, listen, you're bringing a 21st century set of values to an 18th century situation. That is presentistic and anachronistic. Okay? In, uh, I mean, that nobody that I know of in the late 18th century in England, America, anywhere in Europe believed that a biracial society was possible. It had never existed before. It will never exist. It, 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 it's, it's like it doesn't come into existence in the United States until the middle of the 20th century. And I, I, so I, bringing I, these values back into the late I'm 18th not, century is fundamentally destroyed. I'm not bringing the value in. What I'm saying is that if you have a framework that makes certain exceptions for certain categories of people, that has an effect upon the way you view the world. What I'm saying is now, that they're, un they're nervous about the very exceptions they're making <laughs> with regard to the Native Americans. There is, and that, that they know that isolating different racial groups and enslaving them is at odds with what they claim to believe in. They know- Even Southern planters who own 300 slaves know that. They're trapped. They're trapped because they wanted something else. They're trapped because their whole economy and way of life depends on- They wanted life. prosperity. Yeah, and the Northerners too. Pardon me? I said, and the Northerners too are trapped by it because the continent sent up to the North. Like yes, I mean, yeah, but yeah, the, the North is a segregated society. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, you know, slavery is integrated, as I said, warp and woof throughout the entire American society. Well, how does this shape our foreign policy? Well, the, the question that we're asking right now is whether or not the foreign policy, as Joe described it, as being profoundly anti-imperial, is accurate. Because we don't want to subjugate some people but we are willing to subjugate other people. Now, Joe is making the argument, and this is a very powerful argument, that what I'm doing is taking the values of the 21st century and in trying to impose them on people who live in the 18th century. I'm not doing that. I'm just basically saying, you know, the anti-imperial framework here is not 100%. The anti-imperial framework had what were called exceptions. I agree with, I don't disagree with that. If okay. you're a Native American, this whole anti-imperial thing doesn't look very plausible. I agree entirely. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, the anti-imperial argument is going to resurface time and time again in this course. Okay, when we get to the Spanish-American War, you're going to see it again. When you get to Vietnam, you're going to see it again. It exists in the United States. There's no question. Whether or not it determines foreign policy is an open question. I would like to think of myself as being part of the anti-imperial constituency. But, you know, I'm vainglorious. So, what can I say? All right, let's go. The, the right of conquest is over, okay? That was the assumption that, we, that, that was brought to bear when the United States was created. Now, the other assumption that's brought to bear is the Kantian notion of uh, the democratic peace, essentially. Now, the democratic peace is a, a, an argument that Kant develops in the midst of the Enlightenment, okay? And in fact, the very term Enlightenment originates with Kant. Right. He gives it the name. Right. This is 1795, okay? 
So it's very closely related to the values that inspire the American Revolution uh, and the French Revolution, although it's interesting. The American Revolution is much more constrained. It talks about American citizens. With the French Declaration of the Declaration of Man and the Citizen makes it universal. You know, I mean, the, the French have a much more expansive view of how Enlightenment ideals should be. It's also a matter of pace and, and velocity. Um, Washington wrote to Rochambeau, who was the French general commanding the French army in Yorktown, and went back to Paris. He eventually got guillotined. And uh, he said, you in France like to drink your soup fast. It's hot and it scalds your throat. We Americans like to blow on the soup and wait for it to cool down before we eat it. The French Revolution was a revolution. The American Revolution was really an evolution. Yeah, in many respects, that's true. Now, when Kant is thinking about the problem of war, he's trying to bring Enlightenment ideals to bear on the problem of war. And his fundamental uh, concern is, is war rational? Understand that the Enlightenment uh, elevates the idea of what they call right reason, rationality, to the highest pinnacle. It is right reason which enlightens us, which liberates us. Thus, people who are part of the Enlightenment become liberal in the classical sense of the word. That's why you're at a liberal arts college, okay? I mean, this is what the Enlightenment is all about. You're employing your faculties of right reason to try to understand problems. And so Kant is looking at the problem of war. And he essentially says this, look, the people who profit from war are few. The people who pay for war are many. Does that make sense? And for him, it doesn't make sense. Then why do, do wars occur? Because the few have the power to ignore the many. His solution to this problem is to allow the many to have a voice. And his argument is very straightforward um, in section two of, of uh, Perpetual Peace. I don't know. I should have started this up. I think it's very appropriate that Kant's screen is blank. <laughs> It's just warming up, Sarah, that's all. I, I hadn't pressed the on button. Thank you. I only want you to see this so you know where it is in, in the readings. The Republican Constitution, and for by Republican, Kant is show, displaying his distrust of direct democracy, okay? He doesn't like the idea of people voting on policy decisions. He's very typical in that regard. All the framers didn't have the vaguest idea that they were creating a democracy. Democracy right. was an epithet. Democracy is mob rule, demagoguery. Right. Um, swoonish swings of popular opinion. Republic, republica, things of the public. Um, meaning, and there's a filtration process in any political framework that re while it's based on a democratic foundation, people can vote, that the higher up you go in the hierarchy, the further you get removed from popular opinion. The House is directly elected, the Senate is elected by the state legislatures, the President is elected by electors, the Supreme Court is appointed by the President, so that the level of talent and intelligence and patience is increased, so that at this stage in the late 18th century, Kant and most enlightened philosophers of an American sort believed that they created not a democracy, but a republic, which is really a different creature. Very different. The Republican Constitution, besides the purity of its origin, which basically means because I've just thought about it, 
also gives a favorable prospect for the desired consequence, that is, perpetual peace. So he's saying, if we have a Republican Constitution where people have a chance to vote on how their government makes decisions, then we have a greater chance of achieving peace. The reason is this. If the consent of the citizens is required in order to decide that war should be declared, nothing is more natural than that they would be very cautious in commencing such a poor game, decreeing for themselves all the calamities of war. Among the latter would be having to fight, having to pay the costs of war from their own resources, having painfully to repair the devastation war leaves behind, and to fill up the measure of evils, load themselves with a heavy national debt. So what he's saying is that if you ask the people who we actually send to battle, young men and women, and you ask their fathers and their mothers, should we go to war, they will say no. The only people who want to go to war are the rulers, the leaders. And they get all the benefits of the war. They get all the benefits of conquest, the tribute. But they don't send their sons and daughters into battle. They're not going to die. They're not going to have to worry about anything. So for Kant, it is this impulse to make sure that the publics are invested in decisions of peace and war that is necessary to uh, to prevent states from going to war. So that uh, PCR song is pretty popular. Yeah. <laughs> Fortunate son. Fortunate son. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Say that again. I'm sorry. I missed that. There's a Creedence Clearwater Revival song called Fortunate Son, oh. which is all about um, the privilege <laughs> not having to pay the, the, the price is, of war. Is, if I hear you correctly, Benny, Kant, if we could bring him by time machine to this class from now, would say, the United States, as it currently functions, is creating an exception to the principle that I have just declared because I have essentially immunized 99% of the population from having to serve in the military. Right. Kant would be in favor of a draft to make sure that common citizens have a stake in the decision to go to war. Um, he would also make sure that you had to pay for a war as soon as it's fought, that you can't put it thing we in the- That's another because if the Iran war and the Afghan war were both put on a credit card. Right. Like, like they were both created a separate budget, so it wasn't even included in the annual budget what it actually cost. Right. You know, when you look at the way the United States went to war in 1917, in World War I, and you're going to read Woodrow Wilson's uh, request to the Congress for a declaration of war. Wilson is going to specifically say, we have to raise taxes in order to pay for this war, and we have to implement a draft in order to go to war. He's very clear. He employs the Kantian principles here in the decision to go to war. Now, interestingly, the United States still decided to go to war. So it's not clear that the Republican Constitution is as ironclad a guarantee against going to war as Kant thinks it is. So with the draft, how would that affect, it doesn't mean that people would be able to directly go for or against the war. Yeah, but if you knew your son and daughter were going to be drafted, you presumably would be more careful about who you're voting, who you're voting for. You would and be. And Vinny and I both grew up at a time when there was a draft. Whoa. Right. And uh, we knew we had to go. It affects the way you think about foreign policy in a really palpable fashion. It's the reason why I teach what I teach. If we had a draft, we would have never gone to Iraq. I think also there's the universality Without a draft, I mean, obviously, you know, the upper echelons of society won't send their sons to war. Whereas with a draft, mm -hmm. they're as subjugated as the poor people are to go to war. Also, so there's something to be said about that. Not necessarily. I mean, with that argument, I mean, the 
Richmond Right, but say if there's, say, what, what I mean by draft, I mean say if there's a, a legal obligation, a universal draft that, say, will, I think that from the Kantian point of view, it would, you know, it would, it, it would transcend, you know, collegiate acceptance or anything where you have to go regardless where you are in your social strategy. Yeah, if the college is not going to save you, the college is not going to save you. I mean, right. right. If you go to college, they just get you when you finish. Right. That's what they did to me. Right. Well, the other thing to remember is that you know the draft only applied to men before. Ah. Now, if it's ever reinstated, it would have to apply to women. There is no reason in the world why women should not be drafted. Now, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you. Pardon me. Like, we are all agreeing. It seems to me that eliminating the draft violates a Kantian principle that is important. But if you could vote. Would you vote for a resumption of the draft, or I'll give it to you in a better way, mandatory national service for every man and woman in the United States sometime, sometime between 18 and 25 of two years? Everybody's got to go do something, and military service is one of the options. This is what they do in Israel. Um, how many would vote for that? See, nobody votes for <laughs> yeah, let's have a vote. Let's see your hands. How many would vote for two years of required national service? No, you could do it teaching or working in conservation or teach for America. Right. Peace Corps. Peace Corps, something like that, where you have to give up two years of your life to serve the country. Okay, there are too many people talking at once here. <laughs> Men have to register for the draft. Women do not have to register for the draft. Yeah, all men, when they reach the age of 18, have to go to the post office and register for the draft. They still have to do that now. Yeah. yeah. Emily. Okay, one question at a time, okay? I, I do, but don't think that voting is the only time where citizens can express their point of view. No, I, I, you know, I, mean, no, I completely agree with that. Yeah, you know, I mean, Kant would want citizens to be writing their congressmen, sending telegrams, standing out on the street, okay. things of this sort. But more importantly, Kant wants the government to listen to the people. Kant is talking about a world in which kings the monarchy, don't forget, the idea of a citizen government is a new thing. Right. The United States has first come up with it. We're still in a world of monarchy. Kant is saying the kings don't have to listen to people. They can do whatever they want. There's they a great line from Diderot, who's one of Kant's protégés in France, and he said he wished to see the last king strangled with the entrails of the last priest. <laughs> <laughs> That's delightful. <laughs> I hope you all have and if lunch. You get rid of kings and priests, and in Kant's view, if you get rid of the kings and priests and you create a truly Republican government, the rules of the game change, the chemistry changes. To say that human nature changes would be a little bit, he would say that up until that point, the real natural law that governs human behavior has been distorted by monarchical and priestly forces. That's called the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. Now, and they were in the cave, and now they've come out of the cave into the bright sunlight of the Enlightenment, and that they now are kind of new creatures. And any philosophy that depends upon a fundamental transformation of human nature is no. obviously going to be disastrously wrong. No, this is how Kant defines human nature, the status naturalis, 
The state of peace among men living side by side is not the natural state. The natural state is one of war. This does not always mean open hostilities, but at least an unceasing threat of war. A state of peace, therefore, must be established. It is not part of human nature, according to Kant. It's got to be imposed. We've argued this for, excuse me, 20 years. <laughs> and, um, and well, this is I an old argument between it. us. I don't get this, okay? And you always say <laughs> this. The whole point of perpetual peace is to argue that if you allow human beings to freely express their opinion, they are rational creatures that will always oppose war, okay? That's what you just got to tell us. Now, this, and the title of this thing is Perpetual Peace. Right. Okay? The whole idea of perpetual peace, according to that paragraph, is ludicrous. There's not going to be a perpetual peace. The natural state of human nature is war, and that, you know, therefore you can never get past that. Um, therefore. No, it, peace can be established. How do you do that? By creating a Republican Constitution. And the Republican Constitution. Constitution depends upon primarily the consent of the government. That's right. If the government are predisposed to war, they're going to go to fucking war. Excuse me, they're going to go to war. <laughs> like, think about Nuremberg, okay? Those 100,000 people cheering Hitler as he tells them about ready to launch World War II. They're not there under duress. They're there because they believe what he's telling them. Um, and, you know, you know, and the, it seems to me that that this is a pre-Freudian idea. It is believe, it's based on a belief in human nature that is enlightenment-driven and assumes a certain level of rational control. That ever since Freud, it's pretty clear that's not what really drives us. We're driven by passions, id-like energies, things we don't even know about, okay? And, it, and then to push it a little further, everything in the 20th century from World War I to the Holocaust shows that those assumptions are ludicrous, utopian. You know, this is Santa Claus Easter Bunny bullshit. Um, and um, like that, really, perpetual peace. I mean, who in his right mind believes that perpetual peace is a realistic possibility for the human species? Not me. The question that Kant is raising is who in their right mind would give their consent? to pay a heavy price and get nothing in return. That is his assumption of rationality. That's the reason it's wrong, because they don't think about it that way. Well, can you give me many cases of where people knowingly say, I will give more than I'm going to get back in return? They don't think about it that way. Of if course they do. Says, Hitler told them. If they says, we're at war with Japan, <laughs> I'm going and I'm going to kill Japs, OK? And they don't think that if they're going to get killed. They think they're serving their country, and they got a lot of support from their family and their neighborhood to make them think that way, OK? Um, and when German soldiers volunteer in World War II, they don't think I'm supporting some Hitler or Strick. I'm supporting the Deutschland. The, the, you know, and, and their identity is wrapped up in, in that kind of larger prospect. It's not a rational decision. Well, and it the, is the a, assumption that it is a rational decision is a, you know, flies in the face of everything that we know in the 20th century. The reason why you say it's not a rational decision is because you know the German soldiers were lied to. In what sense? That they weren't told what the true purposes of the war were. <laughs> I mean, like, in other words, if Germany were a republic, that wouldn't have happened. Basically, all you're telling me is that all democracies can be like monarchies if the people who run the democracies are smart enough to lie to their people. I will concede that argument, OK? But that's not what Kant is talking about. Kant is talking about a citizenry that will demand accurate information. No such citizenry has ever I existed that know. way during Vietnam. Yeah, but I, whole population, but, not, but yeah. I'm not weird. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are, really. You are. You're removed from it. You have to step back. He wasn't the only one resisting. I mean, obviously, but there's a vast cross-cultural movement. Right. 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 Right
Right. Are people well. like Look, if you you're going to say everyone. that wars will occur because we have duplicitous governments, Absolutely. well then we can end the class now. <laughs> okay? Because there is no solution. You accept duplicitous governments, governments that will lie to you, then what's the point? Just you know, lie down and lie. whimper, to, okay? Well, That's deceived. what you should do. We can be deceived, but you've got to refuse not to be deceived. I don't know why it's chimerical to think that the demand for truth is fantasy. How else do you establish a society? And I they think that is that. definitely but true. Yeah. But you wanted to believe that. I didn't want to believe it. Wait, 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 back, wind it back, wind it back. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Tammy and then Wendy. You see, I had to that we wanted, but we were deceived in believing. Because we, we wanted, yeah. okay, never mind. <laughs> Look, we wanted to get the people who committed the atrocity of 9-11. We were told that they were a certain group of people. And then we were told to fight someone else. It's at that point where you diverge. I Look, when I saw the planes hit the Twin Tower, my first impulse was, I want the suckers that did this, and I want them dead. Okay, I will concede that freely. But I wanted to know the names and addresses of the suckers. I wasn't going to say Al Qaeda. I wanted to know exactly who they or were, Iraq. or Iraq, or anything like that. I wanted to know their names. And then I would have fully supported killing them. But the idea of invading a country, that was deceptive, okay? Afghanistan did not attack the United States. Believe that we should invade the country? Oh, I absolutely. And I can testify. We, we were teaching that. Yeah. We both said this was a huge mistake. Yeah. You. you. <laughs> Vinny, let me, let, me, let me throw a historical perspective. No, let Wendy talk. Okay. She's ha going to have a fit. There was trust, mm -hmm. okay? That trust was abused. There is another reasonably oh, prominent. That, but it didn't start out as a lot. Right. There's another reasonably <laughs> prominent thinker, <laughs> roughly in the category of Kant, named Alexis de Tocqueville. And Alexis de Tocqueville wrote Democracy in America and published in 1835 based on a visit here in 1831. In Democracy in America, he says, democracies are slow to go to war. But once they decide to do it, they are uncontrollable. He's got a different view from Kant, okay? Um, and I would say, think about the way we go to war. A pattern that's going to reappear throughout the semester. Some event triggers national hysteria. The, you know, the blowing up of the main. It turns out. It was, the, it was an internal explosion. It wasn't done by bad guys, it was an accident. 
Gulf of Tonkin resolution. Turns out it's a pot of whales. It's not a bunch of North Vietnamese gunboats. Weapons of mass destruction. Guess what? They don't exist. But every time that act argument gets made, it generates a hysterical democratic response. I would say that democracies are predisposed to emotional overreaction, and that leaders play on that. Democracies aren't, people are. All right, okay. but democracies are precisely because they're dependent more directly on popular opinion and other forms of government. Well, and then the citizens have failed in their duty. Somewhere in heaven, this will all work out. And you have to keep asking questions. Where is it in a democracy that you say people should not try to figure out what their government is doing? You never say that. You should always be asking questions, always, continually. But, okay. you know, and you should be demanding the truth at all times. You know, all the cases that Joe's talked about, yeah, you're right. The American people were, in some sense, manipulated, but they allowed themselves to be manipulated. Eleanor. Well, not in this class. <laughs> no. I mean, you should have higher expectations of all yourselves. I mean, really. How many, how many people who were eight during 9-11 still have most of their lives or country has been at war? They don't have that deep time frame of reference to, to ask the questions or to see if there's manipulation going on. Because if you're eight and it's and now 10 years later, it's still your whole life, your country has been at war. So uh, you know, where do they get, how do you get the frame of reference? I, I don't get this, this attitude where we're helpless. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I just, you know, there's a word in the English language. It's resist, okay? You know, people, will, I will tell you certain things. You should tell me the hell with you, okay? I'm not an authority. You know, I know how susceptible human beings are to wanting to believe certain things. But that's an indulgence. You're adults. And we cultivate your intellects so that you can ask questions because that is your duty to yourself and to all those people that you love. It's not just something you might want to do. It's an imperative. Right. The difference is the rationality, not to diminish the rationality of the eight year old, I understand the emotions, but like me and Wendy and both of you, we were adults when that wasn't happened. And our rationale comes from a completely different place from the eight year olds and the decision to go to war. And that whole frame of reference is very different. We know how to process that. But I had to talk to my son, my younger son. Right, but. And I didn't say, you know, go out and find a Muslim and kill him. Well, and you know, that's not what I'm saying, but it's when you're eight and your response is they did this and I want to get back at them, that's like she pulled my hair, I'm going to pinch her now. Okay. That's not how adults. That's why we have parents. I agree. I agree. But, you know, look, democracies don't work if people don't do their job. It's, democracy is not self executing. You know, I mean, it's hard work. Okay, oh shit. Uh, okay, one, two, three, four. That's it, then we have a quiz. Now wait, before, before the first person talks, I'm gonna start handing out the quiz. Now, what you do is, as people are talking, you don't look at the quiz, you keep it face down. And no one turns it over until I am absolutely convinced that everyone has a copy of the quiz. 
and then I will say, turn it over. Okay? All right. I, I taught at West Point for three years, and, and they had this big honor system there. And if you, Names on the back. And if, they, if you turned the paper over, you were out of the academy. That was it. All right. Now write your names in big block letters like you were in second grade, okay? You have the worst handwriting on the face of the planet. All right. Now let's continue the discussion. Be quiet. I agree. I agree. But the, yeah. understand, the onus is on the citizen. Yeah. Okay, always. Well, I actually had a pretty different experience with 9/11, 2001, 2002 in general. Because um, I'm from a very small town. The big event in my at the time of my childhood was the uh, protest against the Iraq War. Because we were all, I mean, me and my friends, pretty much we were happy. Anybody that doesn't have a very big protest every weekend, you know, for a year. I understand that sense of futility. Right. I know what that means. Yeah. I think also, what uh, someone just mentioned two comments ago, I don't think we as Americans have, a lot of us don't have the capabilities to question democracy enough. I agree with you, Vicky. We all have an imperative, especially now that we're getting the liberal arts education, to go out there and to question every duplicitous act of government, every act of government in general. But if you look at the sweeping range of Islamophobia after 9-11, I mean, in some liberal pockets of the country, of course, there were there's dissent. But I mean, that kind of attitude obviously is an indicator that for the common median of American citizenry, there's no impetus to ask those kinds of questions. I mean, and you mentioned before a very powerful entity is that of the nation state. And what's another powerful, you know, tactic? Fear mongering. I remember as an eight-year-old. I had nightmares. I, I grew up in the New York metro area, so I had nightmares that Osama bin Laden was in my room. You know, I remember very vividly as an eight-year-old boy. I think that it's something to be said. The last comment I really appreciate is that I don't think we need an educational system that provides citizens with the tools to question duplicitous action. I, I don't think we have that yet, and it's been demonstrated time and time again by, I think, popular American sentiment. Vinny and I grew up not worrying about Osama bin Laden worried about the bombs. Right. We were going to get bombed. Uh, every every uh, week or two at school, you have to get under the desk, you know, and pretend like that's going to protect you yeah. when the nuclear weapon really strikes. And, um, like, when I was in the Army, I was in Officer Basic, and there was this one class where they said, okay, this is the device you will carry with you on your back, in your knapsack. If there is a nuclear explosion, whip that sucker out, sight down the thing and call in the height of the fireball. And I said, as soon as we look at it, we're blind. <laughs> so the notion that there's nuclear, but we grew up thinking we were going to get killed. Um, and, and, by, and in retrospect, there was a pretty good chance that was going to happen. It wasn't, it wasn't crazy. Um, and for 40 years, that was the condition in which you lived your life. And just one comment. Don't ask the question whether or not asking questions will work, OK? Because then you're putting your responsibility in the hands of how other people respond. The responsibility starts with you. All you have to do is ask the question. And I don't think you have to go in there with an attitude that what the government is saying is duplicitous. You don't have to think that way. All you want is information. And you, as a citizen of the country, have a right to information. And if someone tells you you don't, 
you say, where do you get the authority to deny me the information? I need to make a decision. So don't wait for the world to become perfect. Start with yourself. Last comment and then the quiz. Yeah, well, sorry. Where did I say that? It's, uh, you have to say it explicitly, so I may be wrong with it, but what it seems to me is that you are assuming that you somehow understand why they want to go to war. I think there are probably all sorts of reasons why someone joins the military in the United States. And they run the gamut from the most honorable to the basest. You know? And I think that serving the country is a signal honor. And I respect every single person who is wearing the uniform. I, however, don't think that they make decisions about where they go. They are told where to go, okay? I, you know, the military is an honorable institution. The people I worry about are the people that make the decisions, okay? I've never once doubted the integrity of the American military and never will. <laughs>